night we were out feeding, and for those of you who don't know me, I cook for Open Doors Family Promise Emergency Shelter, and I see houseless children every day. I know Family Promise is an amazing program and the children are safe and on their way to housing. I see those children and it makes me sad that we have so many families struggling. But tonight when I was feeding, I ran into a family in a car. When I walked to the window, this little angel popped up her head. She said to me, ma'am, may I have a sandwich? I'm very hungry. I smiled at her and gave her the whole bag. I told her I'd be back and as I walked away, I couldn't stop the tears. My heart broke for this beautiful, dirty faced child. I saw the shame of the parents and my heart broke for them as well. When I came back after I composed myself, the mom gave me a hug with tears pouring down her face. I gave her my card and assured her that if all the food we gathered ran out, to call me and I would bring more. I touched that little girl's hand and I wanted to scream, I see you and I care. The little girl's face can't be unseen. I cannot get her off my heart and off my mind. I want to hug her, to take off all my clothes and give them to her. I don't care what she needs, I'll find it. I want to see that child smile. It only took a sandwich and some cookies, and she smiled at me, and I knew I'd be seeing her a lot. I need her to know that I care, that I can't walk past her and not notice. Tonight I've gone over every reason that I do this. The heartbreak is real and brutal. I cry myself to sleep a lot over other struggles, but sometimes it's almost breathtaking. I feel like I can't breathe and sadness my old friend comes to visit. I have to remember why I do this. Without people who help without judgment, there can't be a good outcome. This mom had nothing left to hope for nothing left to believe in. And tonight I was the person that let her know that there are people out there who see you and who care. You know, a dream is like a river, ever changing as it flows. And the dream is just a vessel that must follow where it goes. Beautiful lyrics, beautiful music by my favorite theologian, Garth Brooks. The river Garth Brooks sings about is a river of dreams, but the river we need to look at is a little different. It's a river of homelessness, a river of homeless men, women, and children that flows like a subterranean river just beneath the surface of our community. For the most part, it flows out of sight through the alleys and parks and homeless shelters of our city. You and I only get occasional glimpses of it, the panhandler on the street corner, holding up a sign, the person sleeping in a doorway of a downtown business, the handful of people living out of a backpack and hanging out at a local Starbucks, the occasional person pushing their worldly belongings in a shopping cart. You've seen them, but there's more that you and I don't see like the more than 3,000 homeless school students couch surfing with friends, it's called being doubled up, or the recently homeless family trying hard not to be conspicuous as they sleep in their car in the local park. This river also includes the 7,000 people who showed up at the Spokane Veterans Arena on a Tuesday in November to pick up a free Thanksgiving meal. They're part of this river too. You see, they're what's happening upstream but we as a community haven't made the connection yet that those struggling families may prove to be the upstream reservoir of tomorrow's street homeless. Ever ask yourself just how wide and deep this river of homelessness might be? Just how many people are we talking about? As part of this documentary, we wanted to take a fresh look at the number of homeless in our larger community, but we were immediately confronted with a problem. You see, how we define homelessness determines how many homeless people we count. 
For example, the annual point in time count sponsored and required by the Department of Housing and Urban Development defines homelessness in narrow terms of sheltered and unsheltered. In other words, you're homeless if you're staying in a homeless shelter or transitional housing, or if you're unsheltered and sleeping under a bridge somewhere. But under the McKinney-Vento Act, which tracks homeless school students, the Department of Education defines homelessness as not living in your own permanent residence, including being doubled up or couch surfing with family or friends. I think the biggest piece of it that I would like others to understand about families that, that at least that I work with is these aren't the families that we think of. Um, oh, they're out on the streets, they're sleeping under a bridge. These are families that are doubled up staying, you know, three generations in a family because they don't have someplace else or they're staying with friends that maybe they just met last month and which puts themselves and their kids at risk um, because they don't know them well enough. They don't know their background. They don't know what's going on, but it's better than sleeping on the streets. These aren't the traditional, what we think of as, as the homeless population. These are families with kids that are walking their kids to school every day, that are coming to parent-teacher conferences, that are, you know, hanging out and picking up their kids after school. They might be standing next to you and you don't know that they're struggling. Let's illustrate this from the Spokane Valley. The 2019 point in time count showed only 30 homeless individuals in the Spokane Valley. But according to the McKinney-Vento homeless liaisons, whose job it is to track these things, Spokane Valley school districts reported 819 homeless students during the 2018-2019 school year. When we add in family members, those 819 students become more than 1,200 individuals experiencing homelessness in the Spokane Valley. In any way you do the math, 30 homeless individuals in the Spokane Valley represents a serious undercount on the order of one in 40. And the difference is the definitions of homelessness used by two official counts. And what's happening in the Spokane Valley among homeless students and their families is happening in school districts all across our community. As we began developing this documentary, we asked local homeless shelters, along with the City of Spokane Community Housing and Homeless Services Department, to provide us with their unduplicated numbers of people who passed through the shelter systems of the city during each of three years, 2016, 2017, and 2018. By unduplicated, we mean that we're making a serious effort not to inflate the numbers by counting the same people multiple times. And trust me, an accurate unduplicated count is a bigger challenge than you might think. Next, we included numbers for local area school students also experiencing homelessness as tracked by school districts and reported to the Washington State Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. We also made allowances for their families. After all, if the kids are homeless, chances are pretty good that the whole family is homeless. Finally, we compared our revised numbers with those recorded by each year's official point-in-time count. The results caught our attention. For 2016, our numbers showed a total of 11,832 individuals experiencing homelessness in Greater Spokane. But the point in time count for that year recorded only 981, or about 8% of our numbers. For 2017, our numbers showed 11,471, while the point in time count recorded only 1,090. For 2018, our numbers were 11,319 against a point in time count of 1,245. When we averaged our annual totals into a three-year average, we found a three-year average of 11,541 individuals experiencing homelessness against a point in time count of 1,105. Here's the disturbing takeaway. In an average year, we officially count roughly one in 10 people experiencing homelessness in the greater Spokane area. Now, these numbers suggest a compelling reason while we're having such a difficult time moving the needle when it comes to meaningfully addressing homelessness in our community. The issue is much larger than we understand. And these larger numbers quite possibly represent the upstream source of future street homelessness. The numbers strongly argue that homelessness is a large subterranean river that flows through our community and caught up in this river of homelessness like human flotsam are the moms, dads, and kids, all experiencing homelessness as a family. 
Welcome to The Hidden Homeless. My name is Rigby Danger Shoots, and I am eight years old, and I go to Logan Elementary. I live at St. Margaret's Shelter. We've been living here at St. Margaret's for five months now. All the people here, they're really nice. There's like stuff like people will go, will like do beading, bingo, lots of stuff. I like to like paint, draw. That's what I love doing. I love doing art and stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to getting a house. I want to get like a duplex or like an apartment or something. Um, sometimes when my mom comes in the kitchen without me, I'm like, I worry that she's gonna get hurt or something. Her name is Kelly, and she is a very nice person. She is. And very sweet and kind. Um, I wanna protect my mom at all times. Why? Because I love her. Homeless families are the hidden homeless of our community, so hidden that we as a community have more than 3,000 homeless students in our local school systems, along with their families, without ever knowing about them. These families aren't sleeping on sidewalks downtown or panhandling on street corners or camping on the steps of City Hall. They're just trying to get their lives back. When most people think about homelessness in our community, they flash on that guy pushing the shopping cart downtown, maybe suffering from mental illness, maybe suffering from addiction, maybe both. That's what people flash on when they think about homelessness. The truth is the vast overwhelming majority of our homeless are not that guy. The vast overwhelming majority of our homeless are families. They're moms and dads with kids. And they're sleeping in cars, they're sleeping in shelters, sometimes they're sleeping in tents, they're couch surfing with their friends. This is the true epidemic of homelessness in our community. The, the most visually noticeable part of homelessness that we see are the, are the folks we see downtown, the chronic street homeless. But the actual overwhelming majority of our homeless are families. Hi, my name is Kelly Schutz. I'm 36 years old and I'm living at St. Margaret's shelter currently with my eight-year-old son, Rigby. Um, we've been here for about five months. It's been, it's been a journey, I'd say. Um, everything kind of started um, a couple years back. I was in a really bad DV relationship and uh, I lost my kids due to, uh, I just kept going back to him and um, the kids were eventually taken out of the home because it was an unsafe environment. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that happened in between then and now. Um, I just got custody back of my son Rigby in March. So when I was in my 20s, um, I had issues with addiction and um, being having nowhere to go and losing my children. Um, that kind of brought up those addiction issues again. And that was a very huge struggle. Uh, being on heroin and off heroin. St. Margaret's, I think, is the final step, or was the final step to me getting my children. So for me, St. Margaret's has been a huge thing in my life. I had to have like a stable living situation in order for me to get custody back of Rigby. And because this place, you know, St. Margaret's gave me that, I was able to get my son back, which has been a huge game changer in my life. He is, you know, everything to me. He's my motivation for everything I do in life, every single day. Every day I wake up, you know, I eat, sleep, breathe, Rigby, you know, and that St. Margaret's has helped me tremendously with that. And, you know, not only have they given us a place to stay here for the past five months, you know, we have a month left, but they're giving us a housing voucher. And with that housing voucher, we're going to be able to get an apartment or, you know, a duplex or something along those lines. And so they're really going to be sticking with us for a long time. Let's try a little exercise. Let's pretend for a few minutes that you and your family are homeless. You've exhausted your friends and family and have been officially kicked off the couch and asked to leave and go solve your problem. Now you really don't know what you're gonna do. Other than sleeping in your car, you basically have two options. The first is to find a walk-in shelter where you and your family might find immediate help. That's where a shelter like Family Promise Open Doors might help, assuming of course that they haven't reached their capacity for that night and are having to turn people away. 
That's how Gregory Greer and his daughter, Savannah, found themselves at Family Promise Open Door Shelter. Gregory Greer is my name. Uh, this is my daughter, Savannah Goodman. I'm 32 years old, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. So what happened was, me and my parents was, I mean, we weren't sent out of eye. I had lost my wife, my daughter's mother had died, so I wanted a big change. So I, I could have stayed in St. Louis, so I moved to Utah, met my girlfriend, you know what I'm saying? Then we moved to Spokane, Washington, and everything didn't go to a plan. So we ended up at the shelter, try to go from there, and I'm still here. And I mean, I see things getting better, you know? Family Promise is a national organization that serves families experiencing homelessness. And for the past two years, Family Promise of Spokane has operated the Open Doors 24-7 Family Emergency Shelter. I'm Joe Ader. I'm the Executive Director of Family Promise of Spokane. Uh, really, our mission is to end the cycle of homelessness for families in this community. Uh, when we meet people, uh, we usually meet them on their worst day the day they become homeless with children. Uh, and so they are hurting, they are tired, they're ashamed. And we really want to pour into them, equip them, to bring them to a point to where uh, they are happy, they are healthy, they are thriving in their lives, in the community. Uh, and so that's our mission. Someone said that if I come down, you might possibly be able to help me. I'm homeless. Okay, well, come on in. Let's see what we can do for you, honey. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Your second option as a family experiencing homelessness would be a little more involved because it means getting you and your family entered into something called the Homeless Family Coordinated Assessment System, or HFCA for short. It's a homeless database operated by Catholic Charities that prioritizes families according to the severity of their needs, and then works to identify the potential resources available to meet that need. HFCA is the Homeless Families Coordinated Assessment System that starts the process for homeless families who need help through our system. We see um, different families all the time, and depending on what their level of need is, some folks have a higher need than others, and that's why we have the assessment tool, and that really gives us a good idea um, on what the need that family has. So if the score is a little bit higher, then those needs are just a little bit higher. So we're gonna grab folks first that have more higher um, scores out of the assessment tool than folks who don't because they have higher barriers um, to overcome before they can get um, permanently housed. I also do Diversion, and Diversion is a new program into Spokane. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to divert families from coming into the system, meaning these families may have a three-day pay or vacate, they have, may have a 10-day vacate, or they may just be a little bit behind on their rent. And what we do is we try to keep them where they're at. Here's the difference. A family experiencing homelessness can roll in on fumes, walk in the door at Family Promise, open doors, and stay in the emergency family shelter if there's room. But to get into St. Margaret's shelter, a family first has to go through an HFCA interview and have their needs evaluated by a caseworker who can then refer them out to services, including St. Margaret's shelter. St. Margaret's is a full family shelter here in Spokane. We have emergency and transitional housing, and we take referrals for families that come through our coordinated assessment uh, program that need that emergency service. So families will come into our shelter and stay anywhere from 30 days, uh, maybe they'll stay 60 days. Our average right now is about 63 days that we'll have families staying in our shelter. So we have about, last year in 2018, we had about 90% of our, of our families that were here were single moms with kiddos in the shelter. So you see that reflected in the demographics of the family that come through our doors. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, historically, even though we've been full families, we've seen um, the majority of them still being single moms with kiddos. Family Promise and St. Margaret's represent the two primary options available to families experiencing homelessness in the Spokane area. Now, a third option for a family experiencing homelessness would be the Salvation Army. So the families that uh, come to us here at the Salvation Army, uh, we have, um, a variety of inputs for them. But the families coming here, if they're on the street, uh, they move into our emergency shelter housing, and uh, those families are ones that are living in their car, living on the street, um, boyfriends taken off, girlfriends taken off, they have children, uh, it's a family shelter. 
And so they come and move into our, our shelter and then from there we help them get back on their feet either by getting a job or finding the right um, public assistance they can get to to get into permanent supportive housing. We have uh, in the emergency shelter we have 12 units for uh, emergency housing. Um, so for the, that type of situation for emergency placement of a family, we can do 12 families at a time and they typically stay with us um, 45 days to 90 days. Union Gospel Mission runs a shelter for women and children, but it doesn't allow families, moms and dads with kids to stay together. Women and children go to one shelter while men go to the men's shelter. And for a family already experiencing the trauma of homelessness, Separating parents from kids is simply one more trauma in an already bad day. If we as a community are going to genuinely address the river of hidden homeless that flows through our community, we're going to have to do better. Our families are our future, and a significant number of our families are in trouble. I think the biggest misconception about people that are homeless is that um, they've done something to create their situation or that they're all you know, maybe struggling with addiction. Um, not always, that's, that can be an issue, but that's not always the case. That somehow they've done something to get themselves in that position, and I think a lot of us want to think that so that we can maybe not feel guilty about it or worry about it so much and become involved. Um, it's, there's just so many factors that play into this. Um, people find themselves evicted from their house for various reasons, but um, I think we just need to look at everyone as <coughs> you know, a human being that deserves respect and they have some problems they need to work through and these are families in our community and these children deserve it. Children don't ask to be homeless, they're, they're, they don't have addiction problems, so we need to really help the parents help the children. If we took a moment to be honest with ourselves, you and I would probably discover that each of us has a mental picture, our own private misconception of a typical homeless person who they are and how they became homeless. And there's certainly homeless individuals out there who would fit whatever misconception we may have. But the reality is that the river of homelessness that flows through our community is far more diverse than any stereotype we may have embraced. My name is Christina Janine Lee and I'm from Carson City, Nevada. <laughs> I'm 25 years old. My birthday is April 23rd, 1994. So that means I turned 25 this year. I actually moved to California in 2006 when my mom and dad divorced. Um, I've done a lot of hopping back between Santa Rosa, California and Carson City. Um, throughout my youth, um, my mom was a victim of domestic violence with my dad. And there's always a lot of chaos going on. And there's never a dull moment. Um, when I turned around 16, I tried to move with my dad. Didn't work out. He's really rude and narcissistic and controlling and doesn't see anyone other than himself. So I moved back to California. And then I was around 17, already a teen mom. I had my son, Victor. Um, I didn't like the way my mother treated me verbally. She was really abusive. And when I had enough, I snapped and I put hands on her and ended up leaving. I gave my son to his grandfather for a few weeks. And that was my first real experience of homelessness at 17. To be homeless, it's, um, some days are easier than others. Um, I, it hurts me because I have three kids and I didn't think outside of the box that, hey, I'm gonna be raising my kids out of a shelter, hanging out at the park all day, taking the bus everywhere. I didn't plan for this, um, but I love my kids unconditionally, so I don't consider myself homeless. As long as I have my kids with me, I'm at home. My daughter, calls the shelter her home. She says, Mom, are we going home? 
And home is with my kids. I'm not homeless as long as I have my children with me. And um, it, it has its hard days when I feel a burden of having all the stress of getting to the appointments and getting all, like, right now it's summer, so I don't have to worry about school, but school's coming around the corner, school shopping. And I'm fortunate to have met a lot of great people where I'm staying at right now in the shelter, that they have been so amazing. Their children has a great impact on me and I've made lifelong friends in the situation I'm in. Because without them, I'd be sitting on the curb, not knowing what I'm gonna do, not knowing if I have to go back to prostitution or just to try to get a room for my kids to sleep in. And so I'm really grateful for places like this that can help me from going back to what I don't want to do. Volunteering with Family Promise has really changed my outlook on homelessness in our community and just the varied stories of the families. I had no idea what some of the challenges and barriers they had uh, that they have to go through. And one night I was coming to volunteer at the shelter with my husband and one of my students at our school walked in with his dad and there was a bit of surprise on both of our faces and again it just kind of hits home for me since these are students I see at work and I come to my volunteer job here and run into them as well and so I can see full circle what they are experiencing through their school day and then when they're struggling with with homelessness, where they're going to sleep and where they're going to eat that night. And we were able to help them get something to eat, get some dinner because they hadn't had anything to eat and uh, just help them get situated for the night. There's not such a thing as typical homeless. Um, and so a lot of people think of homeless and they'll think of the guy that's standing underneath the bridge with the sign. What they don't think about are families. They don't think about a mom and kids or a mom and dad and kids or a dad and a daughter who are also homeless in our community. Um, they're the hidden homeless of our community. You don't see them out there, so you don't think of them. Um, and so there's not a typical type of homeless, and there's also not a typical type of family homelessness. I would say there's only two common denominators in homelessness in our community. One is there's a loss of community. There's a loss of relationships. Either you never had them that you can lean back on, or something that you did, something that somebody else did, broke the relationships that you had that you can depend on. Uh, or, and the other thing that's involved is some type of childhood trauma. Uh, we will often see uh, adults and children that are dealing with backgrounds of abuse and neglect uh, that then result in uh, homelessness as an adult as well as other uh, mental health and other issues that are involved with that. My name is Stacy Salazar. I work at Family Promise Sister of Open Doors, 24-hour homeless shelter. I uh, became a supervisor with Open Doors. Um, I started off as of an assistant, and then now I'm a supervisor for the afternoon shift, the busiest shift. I grew up in Wyoming, um, was born in Salt Lake City. I grew up in Wyoming uh, pretty much my whole life. Um, in 2004, December 12, 2004, my mom passed away. Um, the landlord wouldn't rent to me, so after that I was pretty much homeless with my children and my kids' dad. We bounced back and forth, never really had a stable home. I was homeless for 14 years. 14 years is a hard, it was a, the long one, but this last time I was literally homeless with no family, no relatives to stay with it was more of a you got to do something you got to you got to put your big girl pants on and figure out and as a single mom you have to figure out what you're doing wrong and then handle what you got to handle i'd go two weeks a month without eating to make sure my kids ate my name is amy robinson i am the lead case manager of open doors Family Shelter. It's a program of Family Promise of Spokane. I have been uh, working for Open Doors for a little over two years. 
I see myself in the journeys that these families are on. Um, I've experienced a lot of the same adversities that these families have experienced. I uh, was a homeless youth at one point, I, which is couch surfing youth as, at one point. I got pregnant very young and I was a single mom without a home at one point. So I, I see myself in many of um, these uh, family stories and I feel like I can kind of go on their journey to becoming stable again in their life and I'm there for them and I can help them kind of find their way. No one plans to be homeless, and no one plans to end up sleeping here. This is where the hidden homeless sleep, if they're fortunate enough to be here rather than sleeping in their car. This is the sleeping area here at Family Promise Open Doors Family Shelter. Keep in mind, this is an emergency shelter, not transitional housing. And before Family Promise opened the shelter two years ago, many of these families had no choice but to sleep in their car or worse. Tonight, 60 moms, dads, and kiddos will sleep on mats on this floor. Can you imagine your family sleeping on this floor in close quarters on mats alongside 50 other homeless family members? Yeah, me neither. As we filmed this in mid-2019, America is experiencing justified outrage over migrant kids and families sleeping on mats and on floors. But where's our outrage that homeless families right here in Spokane have to sleep in these conditions. Families belong in homes. Kids belong in beds. These moms, dads, and kiddos are the hidden homeless, the human flotsam in the unseen river of homelessness that flows through our community. Whose fault is this? It's your fault. It's my fault. It's our fault because we as a community have chosen to turn a blind eye to the reality of what's happening right here in our own community, to these families and to many more who remain the hidden homeless. It's hard because it's sad because um, and you're homeless, like you have nowhere to go, you know what I'm saying, working, then I have no daycare. So that's actually a struggle, then trying to do girls her, that's out of my field, so I'm trying, you know. My top three things to get me out of shelter is finding daycare is number one, um, getting a job, in, in a house or apartment. Daycare is kind of scary for me because if you watch the news, you will see kids getting beat or getting mistreated or not being treated right. And that scares me because I love my daughter and I don't want to be another victim of someone else's kid getting mistreated. I just moved out here. I have no car at the moment. So I don't know where nothing is at, the, at this moment. So I'm just basically looking at my phone, looking around, trying to do this, trying to get things in place. I've been out here for about two months, and it's very hard. Getting around in the city, being mobile, don't have no car. If it's raining outside, you know what I'm saying? But if I didn't have my daughter out here, it, it would be more easier, but it's not no money's job besides me to get that done. It's not uncommon to hear people who have never experienced genuine homelessness to say something like, why don't these people do what the rest of us do? Get a job, find a place, solve your problem. People who've never experienced homelessness don't understand that homelessness is a hole that's much harder to get out of than it is to get into, which is why preventing homelessness is so much cheaper than solving homelessness. And families working to get back to some form of stability face obstacles that you and I don't. The obstacles I see most are uh, is employment issues, um, child care issues. Uh, a mom wants to work and she's got small kids and when she looks at the cost of child care and even what the, what's supplied, um, she can't do it or he can't do it uh, or it doesn't work for their hours that they're, that they're employed for. Uh, another part of that would be transportation. If the person has no vehicle to get from point A to point B and they're 
haven't used the bus. Uh, a drive or a trip to child to work to childcare and home in a car might take them 15 minutes, but if you're on the bus, it could take you an hour, hour and a half. And then when you add inclement, you know, bad weather, uh, it makes it worse. So transportation is a big issue, and it's not always something you can easily solve with a bus. There's always going to be barriers in terms of the basic needs not being met, even though people will assume that there are food pantries, there are places to get formula, there are places to get diapers, there are places to get clothing, but there's still moms and dads that come into the shelter who say, my children has been walking around for the past four days without shoes because they lost one of their shoes. Or my, I'm out of formula now. And even though there is WIC, but there still is kind of a disconnect there. They have to get to WIC. Or if they're not used to being in Spokane and they're not used to that resource, they're still kind of navigating that. So there really is a transitional period of figuring out where the resources are and how to utilize the resources that are here. And yeah, that's, that still goes on today, even for basic needs. In his book, The Ghetto, the Garden, and the Gospel, about poverty in America, Joe Ader explains some of the obstacles families experiencing homelessness face using an illustration he calls the needs ladder. The needs ladder is just a way of visualizing if somebody starts from the bottom, if they are just basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, uh, basic needs are the bottom of the needs ladder. Uh, the top of the needs ladder are things like permanent housing, uh, living wage income, so that you can get to stable ground. The gap between basic needs and that top level is actually like 19 rungs on a ladder. Uh, and we have this idea in our community that, oh, all you gotta do is give somebody some food, get them a job, and then they're gonna be stable. Uh, and that's not the case. There is emotional needs, there's physical needs, there's education needs, there's um, health needs, but there's also identification, transportation, uh, so if you don't have an ID, you can't get a job, right? And if you don't have your identification, uh, well, then you need your Social Security card to get your identification. Well, what if you don't have that? Well, then you need your birth certificate to get that. And who's carrying around their birth certificate with them? Uh, and so you have to order all of that stuff, which costs money, and you have to wait for it to arrive. And so even to just get a job, you've got to get all this paperwork ready. And then the other side is transportation. How do we get to where we need to go uh, when things are so spread out? Um, it's very difficult to, uh, without permanent transportation, without your own transportation, to really uh, become stabilized and survive in our community. Climbing the needs ladder is like negotiating a homeless obstacle course. It illustrates why getting out of homelessness and back to stability is so difficult and why preventing individuals and families from falling into the river of homelessness in the first place should be one of our highest priorities. It's time we focused on upstream prevention rather than downstream rescue. Several years ago, when I served as executive director of Feed Spokane, a food rescue ministry, I commissioned a survey in partnership with a regional food bank to discover barriers to accessing food. A full third of the more than 500 people surveyed cited transportation as a significant barrier. And that's why these are gold in the homeless services community. This is a $4 SDA all day bus pass. But to someone experiencing homelessness, it's more than that, it's transportation, it's freedom. It's the ability to get out and access services. It's a tool for getting your life back. And that's what makes it like gold. So transportation is a huge um, issue amongst our families, uh, especially when you think about families trying to get jobs. They're looking at being employed at non-traditional um, employment settings where the hours are not nine to five, they're not you know nine to seven, and so you have uh, families engaging in uh, the, the Spokane Transit Authority bus routes and trying to have those match those employment options that they're looking at. 
they need to get to so many different appointments. I know a girl recently, I took her on uh, to get her documentation that she needs in order to get into a housing program. She First she needed her, I, her birth certificate for her children. So I had my car, I had her in the car and her two babies in the back seat. I drove her to the Spokane Health Department. She goes in, as I sit in the car, watching her infants, she goes in, purchases, purchases their birth certificates. Now we're going to the Social Security office because that's the next document that she needs in order to get into this housing program. Uh, so we go to the Social Security office. I sit in the parking lot with her two babies because you don't want to take <laughs> children into a Social Security office. Uh, she's in there for an hour and a half, comes back out and says, oh gosh, I need more documentation now. Now I need to go to their doctor and get their health records. I say, okay, jump back in. We're gonna get this done today. So I drive her from the Social Security office down to the Chaz Clinic that's on Perry, in the Perry District. She goes in as I sit in the car with her infants again. She's in there for about 30 minutes. She comes out with the health records and she says, well, the lady said that this would be enough, but for some reason, the doctor didn't sign the paper for the, the health records. So I need to go and get my doctor to sign it. I say, oh my gosh, so where is that? She says, it's all the way up north at the other Chaz Clinic on Market. So I take her all the way up to the Chaz Clinic that's in Market area. Can you please sign this piece of paper for me? I need to get my, my children's social security card. <laughs> and the doctor says, hmm, okay, I'll sign it for you. So she signs it, she jumps back in the car. We go from market all the way back down to social security. Um, and again, I sit in the parking lot. Her babies are with me. She's in social security for another hour and a half. And finally, she comes back out. She's ordered the social security cards and we're done. But we started at 9 a.m. and we didn't get done until 3 p.m. And can you just, just imagine if it was just her doing that by herself with a three-month-old and a 12-month-old and no transportation? There are roughly 253 million cars and trucks on the road in America today, scattered among 115 million households. That's roughly two cars or trucks per household. How many do you and your family have? Now, Imagine not having any, not one. How would you get around? How would you go to the grocery store, to church, to school? And how would you get your kids to school? What about that important doctor appointment? To get to work or to look for work? In a society built around the personal automobile, life changes profoundly when you don't have a vehicle to drive yourself where you need to go. Welcome to just one of the practical obstacles faced by families experiencing homelessness in our community today. And now you know why those all-day bus passes are like gold in the homeless community. In late 2019, Spokane Transit Authority debated the need for low-income or reduced fare bus passes without coming to a decision. Perhaps that the policymakers debating the need didn't have their own cars and were forced to walk everywhere they need to go, there'd be less debating and more practical action. If a one bedroom comes available in Spokane, it's picked up in seconds, in seconds. The list is so long for those one bedroom units. Like I said, it's gonna take three, four years sometimes for folks to even get into a unit. Spokane County is in the throes of a housing crisis that's creating a new homeless crisis. Among the families of the hidden homeless, several significant causes of homelessness are related to this housing crisis. The first is the unavailability of rentals, even for people with money and a good rental history. You can't just say, go and find a cheaper place, because there aren't any. Housing right now for families is very hard. Low-income housing is very, very hard. Um, especially one-bedroom units right now, the vacancy rate for one-bedroom units is like at a point 
three, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So it's super, super hard for folks to find one bedroom unit. So we do have <laughs> a lot of uh, folks who are just kind of milling around and waiting for available units because we can't find any one bedroom units. We've got you know, folks who have um, rapid rehousing through our agency or another agency, or they have hen housing, or they have section eight housing or other housing options, and they have their golden ticket to housing, but we can't get them into any housing because we can't find a one bedroom. So the availability of rental housing in Spokane County is extremely limited for everyone, but especially for low income families. The vacancy rate in Spokane is basically zero. It's at functional zero, which means that it's less than 1%. The second cause of homelessness directly related to the current housing crisis is rent increases. Over the past seven years, rents in the Spokane area have increased 50%. One of the things that we're seeing the most of now are rent increases. And rent increases to a tenant, if the, if the rent increase is higher than 10%, 15%, um, a rent increase of that amount can be the same as getting a notice to move at, or an eviction notice. I, I often say a rent increase and an eviction notice, are there's very little difference. Um, just uh, last week, I talked with an individual who called because his mother was paying $800 a month rent and she just got a notice this week that the rent will be going up to $1,200. That's, that's extremely high, that's a 50% increase, but it's not unusual. My income along with the rent, the rent is taking 70% of my income basically. And that's, that's unheard of and it wasn't like that a few years ago. I basically um, was living at a, a place that I rented an apartment for around seven years. And um, I was a really good um, renter. I, you know, I paid when I needed to. I was never late paying. And um, come to find out later that I would be, you know, get a 20, you know, a 20 day notice to leave. 20 days is not a, a lot of time to find a new place to rent. Um, considering everywhere is raising the rent so high when my rent was like 650 and now everywhere nowadays wants seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars up to a thousand dollars for a two bedroom apartment. People like me with um, a disadvantage of having low income, they might be forced to move out of Spokane when we've hit, been here forever and I find that very sad. What happened to me, I didn't find a lot of resources and it was really too close to call to being, being homeless. According to the Washington State Department of Commerce, national research shows a connection between rent increases and homelessness. A $100 increase in rents is associated with an increase in homelessness of between 6 and 32 percent. Simply put, there's an identifiable relationship between rising rental rates and rising homelessness. To expect rental rates to dramatically rise while expecting rates of homelessness to dramatically fall is a fool's errand. And this brings us to the third housing crisis related cause of homelessness, a bad rental or personal history, including things like bad credit or having an eviction or a felony on your record. Struggles that I see um, for families that are trying to get into housing, that would be if you have an eviction on your record, you're gonna work 100 times more um, to get into permanent housing. If you have a felony on your record, um, that's a huge barrier as well. If you have any type of landlord debt, you're gonna have a hard time finding housing. And so even, even though there's not much available out there to a, um, someone who doesn't have those issues that they're up against, just think about the people who have the felonies, the evictions, the landlord debt, it's, it's even harder for them to find someone willing to rent to them. According to the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, the uh, rising rents um, and eviction are the two leading causes of homelessness right now in the state of Washington. Um, we see that exact trend here in Spokane. 
Um, and when tenants, many tenants don't even wait to get evicted because we have no cause notices to vacate and they know they can't defend themselves, so they'll just move. I call those self evictions because they just know they don't want to get an, an eviction initiated that would soil their record, so they move, whether they have somewhere to go to or not. There's obviously a limited amount of resources and housing to put homeless families in. Uh, we're building quite a bit of new homeless family housing. The reality is in our Spokane community, we have about 50,000 people living at or below the federal poverty line. It means there's 50,000 people who are one broken down car, one unexpected medical bill, one lost shift at work away from becoming homeless and going into that spiral. The majority of people who are homeless in our community are not homeless because of addiction or mental health. They're homeless because of the housing crisis in our community. They're homeless because they're getting squeezed out of affordable housing and they simply have nowhere else to go. So Spokane Housing Authority really believes that housing is the foundation that you have to have in order to work through any other issues that are going on. Without that foundation, you're stuck. You have to have that foundation in order to move forward. That's crucial, it's critical, it has to happen. We need to make housing available to people in order to help them deal with anything else that's going on in their world. So in my opinion, with landlords being able to evict with no cause, I think that hurts the tenant's rights and it gives the landlords basically power and to wield anything they want to do and, and what does that leave the tenants with? Nothing. You know, it, it, it totally takes advantage of the tenants. I think the best way that we can prevent homelessness is to protect people in the homes that they're living in already. It makes no sense that when we have a homelessness situation like we do in Spokane that we make it so easy for a tenant to lose their home. No reason, no cause, 20 days, it seems to me we should be able to fix that. Families experiencing homelessness or those living on the bubble of homelessness need all the same things you and your family need. But they're often unable to simply go shopping for basic things like toiletries, toilet paper, diapers, back to school supplies, and even clothes like shoes. Mission Community Outreach Center works to fill that gap by providing clothes, household items, and toiletry and personal hygiene products free of charge for low-income families and individuals. Their infant bank provides diapers, wipes, and other infant supplies. And today, we're joining them at Stevens Elementary School for their signature annual event, the ninth annual Kids Free Shoe Giveaway. Before this day is over, Mission Community Outreach will give away 1,640 pairs of brand new shoes and socks. How big is the need for this free shoe giveaway? Sometimes a picture tells the story better than anything we could put into words. Our videography team caught this drone footage. It's one hour into the event, and the line of families waiting their turn stretches out the door and down the block. How big is this need for struggling families? It's huge. I'm Allie Norris, and I'm the Executive Director of Mission Community Outreach Center, and today is our ninth annual School Shoes for Kids giveaway. And at this event, we give brand new shoes and socks to kids kindergarten through eighth grade right before they head back to school. And we expect probably between 15 and 1,700 kids to come through today. And this is the first year we've done it at Stevens Elementary School, so we're really excited about the larger facility space that we can use. But we need about 250 volunteers to run this event all day. And we're here from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. this year. A lot of the families that we'll serve today are hardworking families that just need a little bit of help to make ends meet right before they go back to school. We have probably 1,850 shoes in the room right now. Um, last night we had to go shopping again to try to fill in some sizes. All the shoes and socks for this event are brand new right out of the box. Um, and so the kids get brand new shoes before they head back to school, which is really exciting. And we're lucky to be able to provide this service for the community. Along with the new shoes, we give them a brand new pair of socks. So they have to come in through the sock room first, get, take off their old shoes, get a brand new pair of socks to try on their brand new shoes. And every kid that comes is fitted for new shoes, which is why the process takes a while, um, which is why we're here all day. So each kid is fitted to make sure that the shoes fit properly before we send them home. 
Tell me what you guys got today. Two pairs of shoes, uh, two pairs of socks, and a backpack, two backpacks, and some food. This day was very important to school. Very. Why? It helps out a lot with money-wise with the shoes and the backpacks because they are kind of expensive. Thank you very, very, very much. We appreciate it. <laughs> There's nothing better than putting a pair of shoes on children and getting them ready for school. And they're so faithful. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And he just uh, fitted a family of how many? A family of seven, seven. from Guatemala. And uh, oh, the, the, different, the different sizes of feet. It's remarkable. <laughs> and uh, just to see a child beam when the, we find the right pair, it's just it's wonderful. I think, for one thing, just this the turnout of the hundreds, I mean, it almost looks like, like thousands right now um, in line still waiting to get into the school uh, is a testimony to the, the need for our, um, uh, well, especially recently immigrated refugee families. In the opening segment of this documentary, we looked at the river of homelessness that flows through our community, including the more than 800 school students, plus their families, experiencing homelessness in the Spokane Valley. Consider this question. If you and your family were suddenly homeless, or living on the bubble and trying to avoid being homeless, would you know where to go to get help? Where could you go to get a free health checkup? Or school clothes for the kids? What about food help? A free meal? or to talk with a housing specialist, or to talk with a judge about a warrant or other court issue. And why are we talking about this at the Spokane Valley Library? Because the answer to these questions was created by a librarian. My name is Eileen Lupert, and I'm the managing librarian here at the Spokane Valley Library. I'm also the chair for the Spokane Valley Connect. We started the Spokane Valley Connect because we saw a need among struggling families. We modeled the Spokane Valley Connect after the very successful Spokane Homeless Connect that takes place every year in January, but is 10 miles away in the city of Spokane. The January Connect is oriented towards people experiencing chronic street homelessness. While it does happen, finding people camping in parks or on street corners is not common in Spokane Valley. But there are hundreds of families struggling and living on the bubble of homelessness. They are living with friends and family or couch surfing. The Spokane Valley Connect focuses on serving the more than 800 school students and their families who may be on the brink of homelessness by providing them with resources they need to get back on their feet and find stability. The Spokane Valley Connect is organized by a subcommittee of the Greater Valley Support Network who understand the need and want to make a difference by serving. Opportunity Presbyterian Church is a great community partner and donates the use of their facility. I'm Kevin Lind. I'm the lead pastor here at Opportunity Presbyterian Church, and we're thrilled to host the Valley Connect and uh, connect with so many uh, people in our community. The groups that have become a, a part of our church have become so because we've met them outside the church walls somewhere, and uh, it's just a matter of getting out and and uh, getting to know people and. Um, joining in a lot of the great work God's already doing out in our community uh, because God's at, at work much beyond the church walls. This year we began meeting in May for the event in September. We scheduled the Valley Connect to catch students and families at the beginning of the school year so we can offer practical things like sports physicals, backpacks, and back-to-school haircuts. This year we were thrilled to have 63 service providers on site which meant anyone coming to the Spokane Valley Connect could get just about anything they needed in one place. They could get medical or dental help from professional healthcare workers. People could get help restoring a stolen ID. They could talk to housing specialists, addiction and recovery specialists, and legal services. Families spoke to McKinney Vento liaisons for their child's school district, and they could find out how to sign their little ones up for free preschool. They could even get a free library card. They received clothes at the clothing bank, food at the food bank, and a hot meal on site. In fact, our guests reported later that clothing and food were the top reasons they came. 
So I'm Cal Koblenz, Spokane Valley Partner CEO. We, we serve about 40,000 people a year, uh, in, in, individuals, and so food alone is probably 1,500 families every month that's receiving some kind of food assistance, uh, whether it's a, a full array of groceries or, or their children in, their, in the schools. We're feeding about 500 children in the schools on weekends, plus we have a summer program to help those that are, are really um, un, unattached or, or unaccompanied uh, young teens that are homeless. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a... It's, it's hidden from a lot of the Valley residents and they don't really understand the extent of poverty and homelessness here in our community. Uh, unless you're working in it, it's, it's not really identifiable sometimes. Well, the fact that 200 people come out on a Friday afternoon tells us it's important because people don't have the resources that they need. And here in the Valley, we have homeless families that are couch surfing and are doubled up and don't have what they need. So they come to a place like this and hopefully they get uh, enough to help get them through the day or the week or whatever it is. I'm a school social worker and my main focus is working with um, students and families who are McKinney-Vento eligible, which is a federal law around homelessness and and how school districts support homeless families. About 819 students were identified as living in unstable or transitional housing situations. They're not out there for you to see. These families are doubled up. They're living with uh, friends, relatives, and um, what we do is, like I said, keeping kids stable in school. That can mean transportation. So in this area, if a student lives in Spokane Public Schools but has, has been attending in Central Valley, we provide that transportation to and from school. Uh, we can help with um, class fees, like at the high school level, they might have different class fees, testing fees um, to get into college, um, doing their uh, AP exams, their SATs, all those have fees attached to them and we make sure that we can pay those fees. Every student who's identified as McKinney Mento um, gets free meals at school. So conceivably they'll have free breakfast and lunch during the school, uh, during the school week. Um, just anything that we can do to make sure that they have every opportunity to succeed in school. Uh, we're excited to see today finally come together. Uh, there's been a lot of hard work but done by a lot of people to bring together 64 vendors. Uh, we're about halfway through the day and we've seen about 200 people so far. Um, the services that we hope to be used well are, uh, they're down getting warrants quashed, haircuts, they're get, taking showers, they're reaching out to health agencies. Um, we've had several requests for uh, clothes, actually a lot of clothing bank people have come through today. My name is Jessica Drew, and um, I came on the bus today from um, the House of Charity um, to get help with clothes and um, possibly bus tickets. Um, we took a shower on the mobile shower, and that was nice. And they got we got new underwear, um, socks, bras, and um, we were able to go inside and get clothing and jackets and shoes. And then um, we also had dinner. We also got some food for the dog. Um, met a lot of nice people. Been a fantastic day, like I'm smiling. And one of the guys noticed that, that was um, in the bus, said it's nice to see the big smile because we don't necessarily get that kind of stuff every day. The Spokane Valley Connect is an opportunity for us as a community to demonstrate our generosity and our fearless compassion towards struggling families in Spokane Valley. This year, we helped 351 of them. It is how we become a part of the solution to homelessness in the greater Spokane area. It's meant a lot, um, and I want them to know that, that um, what they're doing for everybody is, is a huge thing. And um, even if it's a shower or an outfit or even a pair of shoes, it can make a huge difference. And it has, especially in my life today. <laughs> well, I just saw a gentleman that I see in the library every day reading. We just got a haircut and a, and a meal. That, that made today worth it. Sorry, that just gets me. <laughs> the shelter will close from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay? We will do sign-ins in the morning for the night stay. So that's we originally began filming this documentary at the Family Promise Open Doors Emergency Family Shelter 
During a moment of uncertainty and high anxiety in the homeless services community, we didn't plan it that way, but we found ourselves in the middle of a very emotional moment. The city of Spokane had recently announced grant funding awards for emergency shelters like Family Promise. Those grants were dramatically less than either what was requested or what had been awarded the previous year. As a result, staff were being laid off and more than half of the families in the shelter on the Friday evening we were filming would not be there by Monday. Families already experiencing the trauma of homelessness and life in the shelter discovered on Friday that they would need to make other arrangements by Monday. In other words, many of these moms and dads and kiddos would soon be sleeping in their cars again. While we began filming this documentary at a challenging moment for Family Promise and Open Doors, thankfully, that wasn't the whole story. For the past several months, while we've been filming, Family Promise has been remodeling the old Casano's Restaurant and Market at Napa and Mission transforming it into their new and expanded headquarters and family shelter. It's a huge step up, going from a 2,600 square foot facility to a 6,000 square foot facility with lots of room for expansion and more services for struggling families. And today, it's moving day. So this is a lot more space than we had before, uh, and it really uh, amplifies what we're able to do in this space. Uh, most of it's open space though, as you'll see over here. Um, this is a day area where couches and chairs will be set up. And then at night, this will convert to a night shelter. So mats will get pulled out, uh, mats on the floor. We do mats on the floor because we have little ones under the age of three. And so they're a fall risk if they're up on a bed. And so we do mats on the floor here. My favorite thing of this whole space is this, this kitchenette area over here. So. Um, three different times uh, in our old space, I've walked in the kitchen and seen a mom just crying. And I you know, asked her, what, what's going on? Why, why are you crying? And she said, uh, I'm fine. It's just, we've been living in the car for the past two weeks and I can't, I've not been able to make food for my own family. So this is the first time I make food for my own family. And so when we moved into this space, we wanted to build a space where Families can cook food for themselves, uh, have that importance of that. And we have three stations for this. It's set up like you would find, uh, similarly to like you would find in an apartment kitchen. Uh, but we can also do cooking classes out of this space. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we also have brand new washer and dryer facility down the way and a meeting space, classroom space, uh, which we never had uh, in our other facility. So all of these things are super exciting for us. We open this documentary with Julie Garcia describing the personal ache of working with families experiencing homelessness. But homelessness is an ache in the heart of our community that affects us all. We ache for the eight-year-old living in a homeless shelter and worried about his mom because he loves her. We ache for homeless school students without a home of their own to go to or a bed of their own to sleep in. We ache for the family unjustly evicted for no cause or forced out of their home and into a cycle of homelessness by dramatically rising rents. Or the family with young children waiting in line for a pair of new shoes to begin the new school year. They and many more embody the hidden homeless of our community. The collective ache we feel challenges each of us to do better, to get involved, and maybe to become a significant leader in our community. One of the themes of this documentary series is what it means to be a significant leader who works for the shalom, the well-being of others. I call these significant leaders shalom makers. In the course of this documentary, we've met a number of these shalom makers. But there's one shalom maker we haven't heard from yet. This person has spent the past three years pioneering data-driven solutions for families and students experiencing homelessness. Solutions that appear to be working. I'm Ryan Ulrich. I'm the executive director of Priority Spokane. So three years ago, Priority Spokane identified student and family homelessness as a major issue for Spokane County. Uh, we partnered with a local university who researched best practices and looked at what else had worked around the country. And ultimately, we came up with a plan that placed community health workers directly in some of our highest need elementary schools to work directly with families to help them find housing 
They were also given a flexible pool of funding to use to meet the needs of families. And uh, from that, we ultimately were able to house seven or 80 percent of the students uh, in those schools who were facing homelessness. Uh, when we looked at how best to reach families that were struggling, we realized that uh, so often it was teachers and school lunch ladies and school secretaries and principals that were identifying children that were coming to school with the same clothes multiple days without lunches, realizing that they were those best identifying families either that had already become homeless or were facing homelessness. So by placing our community health workers directly in the school, uh, those staff were able to connect those families directly to that person and, and reach them the fastest. So our university's partners looked at best practices. They looked at data for our region. Uh, we had foundations that our members step up and fund this project, a local hospital, a local foundation, our health district. Um, all of those pieces came together to make this work. Um, we feel this is a model that can be used in other communities. That placement of a community health worker that's specially trained directly in schools, giving them a pool of, of funding that they can use when other resources are not available, uh, was the recipe for success. And also just that collaboration, how you have these different pieces, these different players all working together to support this project. When we looked at homelessness in our region, and looked at where to start, we realized that we absolutely need to better prioritize families. We realized that so often services were going and resources were going to um, individuals facing chronic homelessness, um, adults, and those folks need help too, but recognizing that if we could swim farther upstream and stabilize a child facing homelessness, we prevent them from becoming a homeless youth who becomes a homeless adult. So that prioritization process uh, was especially important for this pilot project and being able to swim as far upstream as we could to address root causes. So of the families that we were able to house and stabilize, after three years, 95% of those families remained housed and stable and no longer in need of our services or help. So that was really exciting for us. In our journey alongside families experiencing homelessness here at Family Promise, we've interviewed numerous yeah, staff and families about their journeys through homelessness. And most of those people, faces, and stories don't even appear in this documentary, mainly due to time constraints. But they've taught us some important lessons along the way. They've taught us that the face and the story of homelessness isn't always the one we might expect, like the grandmother from Mississippi, homeless with her granddaughter, because being homeless was better than what they left. They've taught us that there isn't a single cause for family homelessness. Only two common denominators. A loss of community or relationship that's left them abandoned and alone with no one to turn to. And deep personal trauma that's left them wounded and vulnerable. And at the end of the day, families experiencing homelessness here at Family Promise or at St. Margaret's Shelter or the Salvation Army are asking you and me two basic questions. Are you going to be the next group to abandon me, or will you help me find community? And are you going to add to my trauma? Are you willing to help me heal? They need our help and our fearless compassion. They can't do it by themselves. If they could, they wouldn't be in a homeless shelter.